All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from just up the road in LA by Tracy Crosley. How are you doing, Tracy? I'm doing well. How are you today? Doing fantastic. And Tracy, Tracy innovates in a crowded marketplace of coaches, counselors, and mentors, and perfected a, a method for real change, no matter what the circumstances are occurring in the life of an individual personally or in business. She's a game changer for women leaders looking to reinvent how they li live and lead uh, from the inside out. Okay, so you've been known to say... <laughs> Build a perfect leader for the present and the future. And we'll talk about that today, about self self bias and what holds, you know, particularly women back from becoming leaders. So um so let's get let's get straight into it, Tracy. Like what is what is what is it that specifically maybe holds back women that maybe is a little bit different and more nuanced than than, than men? As far as becoming leaders or yes. as far as, yeah. So what holds them back is a lot of self-doubt. I mean, I think male leaders also, or men potentially that want to become leaders also feel a sense of self-doubt, but I think it manifests differently in women. I think that there's this idea of I'm a woman, who am I supposed to be? There's a lot of conflicting messages. And a lot of times the barriers to entry seem like they're just impossible. And, you know, that's, that's pretty much self-talk. That's again, self-doubt. That's not something that's absolutely a given in the world. It's not the world holding you back, but it's all up here. It's your mentality about it. Right. Because one, one of the things that I came across a, a while back, maybe it was when I was talking to someone or whatever, but it, it was interesting. It's like if, if you see a, a job posting, like generally like, and they say, here's the 10 requirements you have, um, you know, men will look through it and maybe say, Ooh, I maybe have one, maybe two, whatever. I'm going to apply for it. Whereas women would say like, oh, I only have four of these, so I'm not going to apply. And, and it's, I just thought that was a very interesting, interesting difference. I think it's a huge difference. I mean, I was not one of those women. I would still do it. Like uh, I didn't get my bachelor's degree until I was actually done working in corporate. And when I left corporate, I had been a vice president in an advertising agency because every job I went to, if it said I had to have a degree, I'm like, I can still do this job and I yeah. would beat out people doing it. But not all women are like that. A lot of women are also afraid of success because there's a whole stigma around, oh, if you're a su successful woman, nobody likes you. Mm. That's interesting. I'm it's interesting you mention that because it's funny because people often talk about the fear of uh, of failure, but they very but they don't very often talk about the fear of success, which can be even more powerful, as you say, uh, because even with our imaginations, we start seeing all these things. Oh, this is going to change, and this might happen, and all of that, and 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 then you think, well, I didn't actually get the job yet. So, <laughs> it's a very powerful force. Yeah, it is a very powerful force, uh, for sure. I think that most of us, I don't want to go back to, you know, our upbringing, our sure. conditioning, but I do believe that a lot of this starts in what we think is possible when we're kids, right? Because there's people that are always going to take the risks. There's always people that are going to say, you know what, I can do that no matter what, nothing's going to get in my way. And I don't necessarily believe that's a male or female thing. I mm -hmm. think that's an upbringing thing. I think it's a conditioning thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what are, what are some of the ways that you help women to overcome this and start to um, start to really push forward and go after leadership positions, you know, with the with the kind of confidence that they need in order to succeed? I help women to understand that it's not their accomplishments that's going to give them confidence. It's actually who they are as a human being mm. because they breathe. And I don't think most people understand that you can have confidence getting out of bed in the morning and just existing. I think most people tie it to what they've done. And the problem with that is it is temporary. It is not something you can bank on, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you're successful today doesn't mean you'll be successful tomorrow. So one of the things we do is to really work on number one, becoming aware of what kind of thoughts you have in the first place. Are they sabotaging thoughts? Are they, you know, limiting thoughts basically that are based off of limited beliefs you have of yourself. And what we do is we get down and dirty and we start breaking those down so that 
you start to feel what I call a sense of emotional freedom. When mm -hmm. you feel emotional freedom, because I think it's the weight most decisions carry is an emotional aspect to it. You start breaking that down and you realize you can take risks, you can survive, you can do the things you didn't think you could do because now you feel differently. You don't feel so heavy or so burdened or so limited. Yeah, that's a, that's really interesting. Interesting way you put it, because um, yeah, the 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 weight of limiting beliefs, you know, can be can be excruciating. And also, we kind of live in a in a world or a pervasive culture where everything is always kind of pushed on us as if it's as if it's finite, right? You know, right? If you get ahead, then you get something that you know you're you're now getting something that I can't get. Instead of like looking at the world and its its abundance, but I I do feel like that that those limiting beliefs have been bred into us, but also culturally, they're always being reinforced in it for some reason. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's culturally for sure. I mean, you look at different societies around the world and no, you know, if you're in obviously a first world society versus a third world society, mm -hmm. there's obviously a difference in your upbringing. And so there's also a difference in what you think there's possibly there for you, right? Like you were just saying with abundance, most people have a scarcity mindset. And so like one of the things that I've also found with female leaders is you know, women, not all women are there for other women. We also hear a lot of, you know, there's a lot right. of research about it, right? It's like, I have this pie here and I only have this pie. If I have to share a slice with another woman, then I might lose the pie altogether. And that is a fearful perspective, but that's a perspective a lot of women have. They feel that threat of the other woman coming in. And, you know, again, I could go back to generation upon generation upon generation of how much self-awareness are people having when they're raising children? Not a lot. So you're carrying down from several generations the idea of scarcity and that is not enough and therefore I can't share. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's an excellent point, and I do think you know the the, the difference in in cultures. Yeah, I, I like the next door app uh, because that reminds me of all the first world problems we have here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, but it's, it, it is, it is amazing though, because, uh, if you look at all of the things that people are starting to talk about in terms of, of, of work now and leadership, and they're talking about authenticity and, and, uh, and being, you know, being more emotionally aware, having better, all of the things that in some ways we will kind of naturally associate maybe with women. Um, but it's funny, like they're all coming, they're all, and people are, are sort of honing in on different parts like authenticity or like this. But the reality is it's more, it's really the humanization, I think. I think it's the humanization, but I also think, you know, you can go to, what is it? Imposter syndrome as an example, yes. right? So there's an idea when you're a kid that who you are isn't good enough or enough. And so you start to do things to get accolades, to get attention, to get love, to get something positive, right? So maybe you go get straight A's or maybe you become great at sports or you do things to elicit responses from mm -hmm. other people. And we carry this to adulthood without really knowing who we are, because on some level, you never really accept that person, whoever that person is inside. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's, well, I do all these things. So isn't that make me acceptable? But really, you've built a sort of false person that you are getting, you know, some reward from and therefore when people talk about authenticity or they talk about the, the real selves, a lot of us don't know who that is. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a very powerful point because especially when you start to ask people about why the why of what they do. And, and to your point is, I mean, sometimes even it boils down to the why is people are just doing what they think is expected of them, even either, you know, familial or societal or community or whatever it is, or their role or where they came from. But a lot of it is when you find, when you get down into it, it's people are doing what they perceive is expected of them not what they actually want to do. Oh yeah. That is so, so on point because most of us are trained and then you wonder why you wake up depressed or you wake up feeling disengaged from the life you've built because you are just completing others expectations. But here's the thing. We train other people in how to expect certain, certain, excuse me, certain things from us. You know, we are the ones who are actively doing whatever we feel we need to do to fulfill expectations. But if we stop and we go, you know what, 
this doesn't work for me to fulfill this expectation. Maybe I need to pivot. Maybe I need to look at what would actually be fulfilling because I guarantee you'll probably be really good at whatever it is for, you know, that, that works for you mm -hmm. because, you know, it's like I used to do sales and I hated being in sales until I understood how to actually be successful in sales. And what I have carried forth into my business is I like to build relationships with mm. people, right? So to me, that's what it became instead of being very transactional. And in saying that, I made it fit more to who I am rather than to who it might work for. And yet I still excelled when I was doing sales. Yeah. And I think that's another incredibly important uh, point there because uh, we somehow, we sometimes, like, as you said, I mean, we look at even positions or roles and we say we're, we are expected to act in a particular way here. And as you say, maybe, maybe that's not what we're suited to acting in that way, but that doesn't mean doing it in our way wouldn't be as more, as much uh, as successful or, or perhaps more so. But again, we we'll, we allow ourselves to be maybe conditioned by our experience or, or what, again, going back to what we think is expected of that position. Yeah. And a lot of us are afraid to take that risk, right? It's like if I'm in the familiar, which as human beings, we're kind of risk adverse. We don't mm -hmm. like the uh, inconsistency that might come with that. We like to know what's familiar, what's consistent. And so a lot of times we won't even take that and, and run with it. And so that's why... Uh, you know, there's people that are in corporate going, God, you know, I really want to start my own business. I really want to start my own business. And they'll talk about it for years and then never do it. Or then they finally do it and then they don't do well at it. Maybe they fail. And this isn't everybody, of course. But mm -hmm. um, and then it's like, see, I should have just kept doing what was expected of me because now I've made a mess of things and I got to go get a job again and blah, blah, blah. Instead of looking at what they brought to the experience in the first place, because a lot of times I don't think, again, we give ourselves credit for what we do. And you can't just go, oh, I'm good. You know, pat yourself on the back. You actually have to believe in yourself. Yeah, I know. And, no, and I, I, do, I agree with that. And I think the looking backwards is sometimes, uh, it's sometimes you need to, I, I had, a, I had a, a friend recently who was going through some stuff and was trying to like reorient their future and stuff. And they were saying, you know, but I don't really have that good a track record. I don't really have much to, and I said, okay, well, let's just, let's just go through that for a moment. We went back over things and I was saying, wow, that's pretty impressive. And you came through that. And then, and once they started to look at things differently, they were like, wow, actually, yeah, I never looked at it that way. I just looked at it. That was a, that was something that happened that I overcame and moved on. And I said, no, but you overcame it and you moved on and you, you built upon it and evolved from there. I said, these are huge things. And I think sometimes we don't spend enough, not too much time, but enough time, like, looking back and going, oh, look how far I've come actually as a person, if not even as a career, just as a human being in the world. Oh, yeah, I definitely think that because we live in a society that's very competitive. Mm -hmm. That's always telling you what you need to do to improve. There was a list somebody put out on LinkedIn. It was a meme, but it was a list of eight things to be a great leader. And the first one was zero ego. And I thought, and I actually did a podcast about it because I thought mm -hmm. there is no such thing. Because yeah. if you have zero ego, you'll be dead, number one. <laughs> you know, you have to have an ego to survive. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you do. And the other thing is, I was thinking they probably mean, you know, zero arrogance. Okay. Something like that. Sure. But this whole list of things you have to live up to were pretty unrealistic. But these are the kind of lists that are thrown out there. Yeah. Like, you know, be don't be a perfectionist and don't do this. People can't just stop doing things because there's a list that says, hey, these are the things you need to do. You have to find out your why. You need to know what is it that drives you. You have to know what your motivation is, whether it's intrinsic or it's extrinsic. And if it's either of, you know, let's say it's both, because usually when you work, it's both. Yeah. Uh, but regardless, it's where is it coming from? Is it coming from a healthy place inside of me or is it not? Because a lot of times we're driven by our demons. You know, we're driven by sure. what we, you know, we think we need to measure up to. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it, and it is interesting. It's like, uh, uh, I, you know, zero ego. It's like that other one that people now are going with vulnerability. I mean, right. and that, that sounds great. And it says like, be vulnerable. But I mean, to most people, like, that's kind of what, 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 what am I doing with this exactly? I mean, it's not something that comes natural to people. And you can't just kind of introduce it out of the blue suddenly. Hello, today I'm being vulnerable. <laughs> no. And the thing with vulnerability, because I, I actually believe in vulnerability, sure. but 
but it's, I actually help people to understand how to incorporate it. Meaning being vulnerable is just being honest. Yes. And most people are afraid of honesty. Well, there's a way that you phrase honesty, not so that you're strategizing and you get the result you want, but at least when you're doing it, you feel confident in doing it instead of weak and like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Yeah, no, no, I, I I agree with that. And I think that's part of the problem is that, you know, we start to isolate these great sounding words and all of that and sort of make them ends in themselves as opposed to looking at them a little, a little um, more simply. One other thing that I just wanted to, to, to ask you is, I mean, particularly, I would say for women, but it's true for everybody, but if you if you look at the world today and the way work has evolved and now we have hybrid working remote working we have contra- people are getting so used to using contractors and all of that is that um, we're becoming whether we like it or not uh, we're becoming much more used to flexible and different working styles hours approaches and it's been kind of forced upon it but it's a fantastic thing for for people i think today because you know go live i mean for a lot of jobs like go live where you want to live go build a lifestyle that works for you and then find the job because you're going to be a lot better at that job if you're peaceful within yourself i agree with that i also uh think that most people have a lot of fear in doing that because Mm -hmm. then Again, you go back and you read articles that are like, oh, all the people that move in the pandemic, guess what? Now you got to go and, you know, move closer to a job. But Mm -hmm. I really believe that when you have confidence in what you're doing and you're not willing to settle and your lifestyle means that much to you, absolutely. Because no matter if the job comes first or the lifestyle, it's what is your priority. And most people, again, two questions that people have trouble answering. They'll say, you know, if you go, what do you want? Oh, I want this, uh, you know, I want success. Well, what does that mean to you? Well, you start doing a deep dive. People have no clue what they actually want. And the other thing is what is important to you? And a lot of times that's a hard question because we feel a lot of contradiction. We feel like I I should say this, but really it's this. Like most people want security. Most people want love. Most people want freedom, right? And it's really difficult, I think, for people to define that. So when you can define those things that are important to you, then make your choices from that. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And, and I think what's happened, like the financial crisis happened with COVID and all that is that uh, is at the time of like locating yourself close to an office in a high expensive area for you to be the first one booted out the door when things turn down and now you're stuck in a high cost area. So I just think it's now it's it's the onus is on, on companies as well to be more creative because the talent is is spread and we have to... Get you. I mean, we did it ourselves here, like a long, we did it way before the pandemic. We actually had run a largely virtual organization um, and we found it far more productive and to bring in the best people from wherever they are. And, and the extra added benefit is because they're so spread out all over the place is you get all these different types of people and backgrounds. And as you discover them over there, I think it's highly enriching, to be honest. I agree. I mean, I have a global crew. So, um, you know, I have people in far flung areas where I just am looking for the enthusiasm. I'm looking yeah. for, you know, people that can do the job and it is not always in your neighborhood. I actually, I like what you just said there about the enthusiasm, because it is true. It's sometimes when you reach outside of maybe the traditional environs that we've found people is you suddenly find all these people who are excited to work, who are excited to do stuff, who are, who are happy, who actually say thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you feel like there is a loyalty there because yeah. a lot of businesses have, t- excuse me, have high turnover. Yeah. And this is something where you can have a lot of loyalty from people and they feel like they're really part of your company. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree 100%. And that's why I think it's a wonderful, I think it's a fantastic time if the type of job you're looking for allows, allows this or lends itself. I think it's a fantastic time. And I think it's a great equalizer in many ways. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic, Tracy. Like all of Tracy's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Sure. So um, my name is Tracy Crossley, once again, and I'm a behavioral uh, expert. And what I do is work with people on getting past their insecurities and whether it's personal, professional and a mix of both. Um, and we have different programs that we offer depending on if it is personal, professional, or both. And they're all on my website. So are my social media handles, everything you ever want to know about me 
It's on my website. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, I would encourage you to go check it out. Like, give yourself the best shot you can at, at like having the best life. And I would say it's always. Personally, I would say it's always probably a mix of professional and personal anyway, but I would really, because I think whatever journey you go on, you learn about the other naturally. Uh, so anyway, I encourage people to go check it out and have the live the best life you can. And thanks again, Tracy. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon.